All right, so I live in the Appalachian Mountains, and if you've heard anything about them, it's probably this. Surge area has expanded as the days stretch into a full week since the youngster was reported missing. If you hear something in the woods, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. Keep walking. You do not want to be outside when the sun goes down. Something very strange seems to be going on inside of national parks. Lately, I've seen these videos all over social media talking about the long history of people vanishing on the Appalachian Trail and in the mountain range that it's named after, and what might be causing those disappearances. Secret National Park Service projects, feral cannibal people, Bigfoot, skinwalkers. You're usually hunted for a long time by these creatures. They're called devil monkeys. Bigfoot is from the Pacific Northwest, and skinwalkers are from the Southwest, but that's beside the point. These mountains have a rich history of folklore, and it can be really interesting to get into that, but these videos can often disrespect the people who have gone missing in these mountains and the people who live in them. Details their experience with the mountain people. It's feral, rumored to be cannibalistic men that lived in East Tennessee in the woods. Generations of people who have like grown up living in these like caves of national parks. So naturally, I started reading trying to figure out why people go missing in my backyard and what makes these mountains feel so strange and eerie. The science and history that I found along the way is frankly more interesting than any conspiracy theory, but it also completely changed the way that I see these mountains. I was left more aware of the dangers lurking in them, but also of their beauty and what sets them apart from any other mountain range on Earth. Most people think of the Appalachians as this area in the south, but they actually extend all the way up to this tiny island off the coast of Newfoundland called Belle Isle. You've probably heard that these mountains are some of the oldest on Earth. They started forming about half a billion with a B years ago. That's pre-Pangaea, pre-dinosaur. Fish had like just appeared. It started out with one tectonic plate sliding under another, forming massive stratovolcanoes, but those mountains were eventually eroded down into basically just gravel. Then 400 million years ago, those same two plates slammed back into each other, this time forming huge, jagged peaks. And then about 290 million years ago, Africa slammed into North America, shoving these mountains inland, rolling and folding them over each other, exposing rock hundreds of millions of years old to form one of the most geologically complex mountain ranges on Earth. Since then, wind, water, and ice have carved these mountains into what they are today and they continue to do so. Like, let's start with wind. Just look at Mount Washington in New Hampshire, one of the coldest and windiest places on Earth. The weather station at the top has recorded a 28-foot snowpack, negative 47 degree Fahrenheit temperatures, and a negative 108 degree Fahrenheit wind chill just a few months ago. At least 130 people have died on this mountain, and it's such a tough climb that it's used to train for Denali and even Everest. Needless to say, I think the weather out here gets a bit more intense than people give it credit for. Next, water. The Southern Appalachian Mountains contain the rainiest places in the US outside of the Pacific Northwest, as much as like 230 centimeters in some areas. Heavy rains have caused massive floods that cascaded through the mountains, carving deep gorges and also allowed for the growth of a lush temperate rainforest containing thousands of species, many of them found nowhere else on Earth. And finally, ice. About 10,000 years ago, the northern Appalachians were buried under massive glaciers. As the glaciers advanced, plants and animals native to the north migrated south to escape extinction. When the glaciers retreated and the climate warmed, those species moved to higher elevations looking for the colder conditions they were used to. A lot of species ended up stuck on mountaintops with no way of migrating elsewhere, evolving into a web of species found only here and some only on individual summits. Now you go up to the mountaintops here in the south and you'll find a landscape that feels a lot more like Canada. These are often described as biological islands, time capsules of a landscape that was widespread during the Ice Age. These mountains provided a habitat for huge groups of bison and elk, packs of wolves, mountain lions, and lynx, and flocks of birds like passenger pigeons, which were likely the most numerous bird on Earth, traveling in flocks numbering in the billions. And what's cool is that the ecology is wildly inconsistent. At the far north, you would find an arctic tundra, complete with caribou, arctic foxes, polar bears, and this guy, the great auk. Basically a penguin. These mountains were also home to people, 
a diverse quilt of hundreds of indigenous cultures living in the valleys for thousands of years. The landscapes of the Appalachians are some of the most complex and biodiverse on Earth, and with that complexity comes interdependence. Upset the balance just a bit and things fall apart quickly. European settlers first arrived here in the late 1400s, but these mountains provided a huge barrier to expansion, and for the first couple centuries, they didn't even try crossing over them. The first people to inhabit the higher elevations were actually indigenous groups, pushed out of the valleys by settlers and the diseases they brought, and forced to take refuge in the mountains. But in the 1700s, the east coast started getting crowded, and settlers started to move inland, once again pushing indigenous groups out and into the plains to the west. The first explorers to cross the mountains describe an infinitely complex landscape of steep slopes choked with dense vegetation and days of darkness under the canopy above. Even Daniel Boone, who's like the Appalachian explorer guy, described the slopes as quote, so wild and horrid that it is impossible to behold them without terror. When these settlers first arrived, the mountains were almost entirely covered by old growth forest, containing trees over eight feet wide and 260 feet tall. But in the 1800s, a timber industry exploded in the Appalachians, harvesting just about all of these forests. Logging companies scooped up huge amounts of land, getting absolutely loaded while paying people next to nothing to move into the mountains and clear that land. These loggers worked long hours exposed to the elements, surviving on rations and packed in large groups into temporary shelters. And as the industry grew, railroads and burns to clear the land caused wildfires that engulfed thousands of square miles of forest. This forest around me is one of the only old growth forests left in the entire Appalachian mountain range and one of the only places on this side of the country where you can come and find just like a really big old tree like this guy. Pretty much all of the area surrounding this forest was clear cut, but the logging companies cutting it down went bankrupt before they could get to this spot at the bottom of the valley. And then a few years later, a wildfire blew through and knocked out a bunch of land, but also missed this spot. So out of pretty much sheer luck, we have this really cool little area where you can come and get kind of a glimpse into what most of this forest would have looked like a couple hundred years ago. Logging, mining, and damming in the mountains drove many species to extinction, including the passenger pigeon and the great auk, and drove many others out of the region. Bison, salmon, elk, caribou, and polar bears, just to name a few. Big predators like bears and lynx had it particularly bad because people kind of just didn't like them and hunted them down for the hell of it. Industry, of course, came with pollution, which contaminated the waterways and even the air. At higher elevations, there's often this beautiful fog, but it's wildly acidic from sulfur and nitrogen emissions. Acid rain, fog, and snow have been a huge problem here, weakening the higher elevation ecosystems and cutting plant growth in half in some areas. European settlement also brought invasive parasites. All over the Appalachians, you'll see these ghost forests, skeletons of entire tree species wiped out by parasites. Just decades after they got huge, the logging and mining industries collapsed, leaving behind a ruined landscape and a population without work, forced to survive off of this steep, rocky terrain that wasn't really any good for farming. With no money and no good roads, these communities were pretty much trapped in the mountains. That isolation led to the development of a unique culture and folklore unlike anything else in the country. Combine that with the way that these mountains and their inhabitants have often been portrayed in movies, TV, and other media, and the cultural image of the Appalachians kind of starts to take shape. There's also just a spooky vibe here. Like, we know that the mountains are old, but you can also just feel it. The boulders, the twisted trees, the fog. It can be a bit eerie. It's honestly not that surprising that people think this is a creepy place where weird stuff just happens all the time. But it isn't. It's a place with a unique, and I'll be the first to admit, sometimes quite off-putting culture and centuries of folklore. But that doesn't mean there are cannibals or skinwalkers hiding in the caves, kidnapping unsuspecting hikers. The Appalachians have this reputation as spooky and haunted, but they also have a reputation as kind of the wimpy mountains on the other side of the country. 
But honestly, my biggest takeaway from making this video has been that these mountains are a lot more intense than people give them credit for. Sure, they're not as big as the Rockies or the Cascades, but this terrain is steep and overgrown, difficult to navigate, with weather that can go south really fast. You're probably familiar with the Appalachian Trail, which runs through a big stretch of these mountains. The AT is about 450 miles shorter than the Pacific Crest Trail out west, but it typically takes people a few weeks longer to complete. This terrain is just deceptively challenging to navigate. It was 400 years ago, and it still is today. It's easy to get lost or injured, and hard to get found. The dense forest and steep terrain make it difficult for search parties to cover ground, and nearly impossible for planes or helicopters to spot someone beneath the canopy below. Sure, these mountains aren't as large as others, but that doesn't mean they aren't just as dangerous. Just as this landscape continues to present plenty of threats and hazards today, it continues to face plenty of threats and hazards of its own. Mountaintop removal for mining has literally blown thousands of square miles of mountains to pieces, fracking for natural gas here contaminates groundwater and rivers, and climate change is causing ecosystems to migrate to higher elevations, which isn't great for the ones that are already stuck on the tops of mountains, like the biological islands we talked about earlier. But a lot of things have actually been improving. As the forest that was cut down 200 years ago has grown back and been more carefully regulated, many of the species that went with it have been returning too. Moose, bald eagles, bears, hell yeah, who doesn't like bears? And other species have been deliberately reintroduced, like elk, many of which were imported from Wyoming. Honestly, the more I learn about these mountains, the more I appreciate them. As the home to some of the rarest and most biodiverse ecosystems on Earth, as one of the planet's longest-running projects, and as just a really beautiful place. 